Okay, so in this lecture session, we are going to learn about Maxwell's equation for dynamic fields. So for this session, we are going to focus on these first two topics, particularly the second one here, stationary loop time varying magnetic field. But before we go into this, let's uh, recap what we have, what you have already learned about Faraday's law, and what is actually Maxwell's equation for dynamic fields. Okay, so when we go back to Maxwell's equation, when we studied static condition, we have already derived these four equations. We have number one. Del dot D equals to rho V. Del cross E equals to zero. That's number two. Number three, del dot B equals to zero. And number four, del cross H equals to J. Now remember that these four conditions is under static condition. Where electric field and magnetic field is isolated from each other. It's independent. Now, when we consider time varying, we will see that the electric field and magnetic field interact together and the equation will change. So, the change can be found in the following table. So, for each of the four equations, it is based on the laws that we studied earlier, like Gauss's law and Ampere's law and uh, more recently Faraday's law. And actually there are two versions of the equation, one in differential form and one in integral form. So we can, we should be able to use either one depending on the value or the parameter that we want to calculate. Now if we observe closely, we'll see that for Faraday's law under dynamic condition, del cross E is no longer zero, but it's equal to negative del B over del T. Remember, E is electric field strength and B is magnetic flux density. So now we see a relationship between electric and magnetic field. Similarly, for Ampere's law, previously when we studied magnetostatics, we derived from Ampere's law del cross, cross H equals to J where J is the current density. Later, when we study displacement current, we'll see that actually, when there is a time varying field, the magnetic field strength, H, uh, when we apply curl to it, we will get the current density together with the electric flux density, D. Right? So it's no longer only J, but it becomes this equation, J plus del B over del T. So now let's look at this equation first. So Faraday's law states that if you have an experimental setup like this, and if you put the coil with the battery close to the loop, under normal condition, if both are static, you won't see any changes or movement in the galvanometer. The galvanometer deflects only when the battery is connected or disconnected. So when you switch on or switch off the battery, there will be a temporary uh, deflection of the galvanometer. But after a few seconds, then the galvanometer will turn back to zero. So this implies that current is induced in the loop when the magnetic field changes over time. Okay, so we have this equation. Flux is equal to integral of magnetic flux density integ integrated over the surface area. And the electromagnetic force, EMF, uh, the voltage or the potential EMF potential is equal to negative N, where N is the number of turn here, number of turn in the loop, and the changes of flux over time, 
of a dt. So we can also replace the right hand side of this equation to get the value here. Now, for Faraday's law, uh, we can conclude that magnetic field can produce an electric current in a closed loop but only if the magnetic flux linking the surface area of the loop changes with time. Now, actually, Faraday took about 10 years to find this relationship. He did uh, many, many experiments throughout the 10 year period to try and, um, and prove this uh, hypothesis that magnetic field can produce an electric current. And only after about 10 years, he managed to uh, prove experimentally uh, how this works. Now he did his experiment in London. Now at the same time, at the same year when Faraday published his results, another scientist by the name of Joseph Henry also published the same result. But he was in the United States. Right? So they published independently, so they do not refer to each other. So that means they, their finding is genuine and because they live far away from each other and their finding was in 1831. So at that time there was no possible way that they can communicate at a, a fast speed. So the scientific community or the scientific uh, society later on decided to honor both of them by naming the inductor unit with Henry and the capacitor unit with Farad. Okay, so that's a trivia for you guys. So coming back to the equation, we see that for magnetic field to produce electric field, the important parameter is the change in the flux. So if there is no change, then there is no electric field. <coughs> so to generate the induced electromotive force or EMF, there are three ways. Number one is by having a time varying magnetic field linking to a stationary loop. So the loop is stationary, the magnetic field is changing. We call this as transformer EMF. So VTR EMF. The second method is a moving loop with a time varying surface area. So we, we, uh, we flip the process. Now the loop is moving but the, uh, the magnetic flux density is static, doesn't change. Now we call this motional EMF or VM EMF. And finally, we can generate EMF by doing both number one and number two. So we move the loop and we change the magnetic field. So we combine them and we get this equation here. The total EMF is equivalent to transformer EMF plus motional EMF. Now note that when I say time varying, it is equivalent to something that changes with time and it's also equivalent with dynamic. So when I say or when we say dynamic field, we mean the same thing as time varying field. That means a dynamic field, a dynamic field always changes over time. So in this lecture or in this video, we are going to focus on the first method, which is how to generate transformer EMF, where the magnetic field is changing, but the loop is static. Okay. So how do we create a time varying magnetic field? Well, there are a few methods, but generally we can classify them into two. So number one is to move a permanent magnet in and out of a coil. So if we have a magnetic or permanent magnet or a magnet bar here and a coil connected to a galvanometer or a sensitive emitter, if we move the magnet, magnetic bar, because the magnet uh, has a magnetic field around the bar. So when we generate, when we uh, move it in and out of the coil, it will induce uh, the EMF inside the coil and it, it will make the uh, emitter move. 
in other words it will produce current in the coil so the, the magnitude of the current will depend on a few factors number one the speed of the movement the faster that we move in and out then the more um, amount of current that we produce and it is also related to the surface area or the size of the loop in the coil so the size of the area will also affect the emf uh, generated another method we can use is by simply using ac supply because ac always changes with time at any given time the value will change so accordingly when the value of the supply changes then the value of the current the magnitude of current also fluctuates and if the magnitude of the current fluctuates then the flux also fluctuates so these are the two main methods on how we can create a time varying magnetic field So consider the figure here, figure 6-2. So let's say we have one coil and we place it on the xy axis. And then we have the magnetic flux moving in the z positive z direction. Since the loop is stationary, but the magnetic flux is changing over time. So we have the following equation. Previously, we have negative n d over dt integrate over b dot ds. Now, because it does not depend on ds anymore, because the surface area is constant. So, we can take d over dt and put it inside and becomes a partial derivative del over del t. And we put it like this way because we want to um, highlight the fact that the change will only depend on the magnetic flux. If we put it outside, then the change can be dependent on the magnetic flux and the surface area. Now we do partial derivative to highlight that it's only being affected by the magnetic flux. That's why we have a change here, slight change. So the transformer EMF voltage is the voltage that would appear across terminal one and two. Right. So the connection between the direction of ds and the polarity of the transformer emf is governed by the following right hand rule if ds points along the thumb of the right hand then the direction of the contour indicated by the four fingers is such that it always passes across the opening from the positive terminal to the negative terminal so actually for the contour because uh, if you follow the right hand rule the position of the thumb can be either pointing upwards or pointing downwards. So in this figure, it assumes your thumb is pointing upwards. So if you hold your hand, your right hand, you put your thumb in the same direction as the magnetic flux. So the, the other, the remaining four fingers will uh, show the direction of the contour. So the value of positive and negative is defined as follows. If you change the direction of your thumb from going up to going down, then the direction of the contour will go the opposite and the polarity will also um, uh, swap. So we'll have positive here and negative here. So that's the basic principle of um, how we define the connection between the surface area and the polarity of the transformer EMF. Now this circuit can be simplified into this circuit here where the transformer EMF can be represented as an AC source and we have two resistance. One is the resistance R here and another is the internal resistance of the wire itself. Okay, so now I haven't touched about the direction of the current. We'll cover this in the next slide. Okay, this is the same figure. So the current, now we can define using uh, Ohm's law, I equals to V divided by R. If Ri is small compared to R, then we can further simplify this equation, I equals to V divided by R. Now the polarity of the transformer EMF is governed by what we call as the Lenz law. 
which states that the current in the loop is always in a direction that opposes the change of magnetic flux that produced the current. Now, this may sound a bit confusing, but it's very simple if you refer to the figure here. Now, the magnetic flux is moving upwards and is changing over time in the positive z direction. So, when it, the magnetic flux changes over time, it's going to induce current in this coil. Now, the current in this coil will move in the clockwise direction because it will also generate an induced magnetic flux that is opposed to this change. Right? So, in other words, uh, the principle is equivalent to friction. If you want to move in one direction, friction will stop you or will slow you down because it's moving in the opposite direction. So, induced magnetic flux is essentially similar to friction. Once you want to change in this direction, there's going to be an, a force that is opposing it. And because the direction of the opposing magnetic flux is going downwards, so the current is going to follow still follow the right hand rule meaning the induced b induced you are going to use your four fingers and the direction of your thumb will be the direction of the current so i repeat you use your four fingers to represent the direction of the induced b so your thumb will uh, point to the direction of the current right so if the magnetic flux is increasing that means uh, d phi over dt is larger than zero, then i must be clockwise. But if the magnetic flux is decreasing, it still moves in the positive z direction, but now the magnitude becomes lower and lower. So now what happens is, although the direction of the magnetic flux is still the same, but the direction of the induced magnetic flux will be opposed to the change. It doesn't oppose the direction, it opposed to the change does not want the magnetic flux to change. So, I will be counterclockwise. Okay, so it is important to remember that the induced magnetic flux serves to oppose the change in the original magnetic flux, but not the direction of the magnetic flux itself. Okay, so coming back, now we want to derive the differential version of the Faraday's law. So, for contour C, the transformer EMF is related to electric field strength E by this equation derived from electrostatic. So, V equals to close contour integration of E dot dl. Okay, so we already know from Faraday's law just now that transformer EMF is equal to this equation. So, we can equate or we can find equivalency in these two equations. If we assume that n equals to 1, so we can say that this part and this part here is equal to each other. Applying Stokes theorem, we know that the, uh, the closed line integral of E is equivalent to the curl of E integrated over surface area. So now we see a pattern, this one surface area, this one is also surface area. So we can uh, conclude that the inside of this part is equal to the inside of this part. So we get del cross E equals to negative del B over del T. So this is the relationship between electric field intensity E and magnetic flux density B. Okay. So let's look at this example. So an inductor is formed by winding and turns of a thin conducting wire into a circular loop of radius A. So the inductor loop is in the XY plane with center at, at the origin and connected to a resistor R shown in figure 6-3. So in the presence of a magnetic field B, so the magnetic field B has a magnitude of B0 and it is moving in the Y plus Z direction. So that's why it's tilted here. Right, and it changes over time because we have sine omega t. So we want to find the magnetic flux linking a single turn of the inductor 
because it's a coil, right? So basically, it's an inductor. The transformer EMF, the polarity, and the induced current. So, from the equation that we know earlier, flux is e equivalent to the surface integral of magnetic flux density. So the surface, if we go back, the surface of the, the area in the middle here, uh, the center of the loop, the surface has x value and y value, but because it's on the x, y axis, the z component is constant. Right? It only has changes over x and y. So because z is constant, we have the direction is z. The direction of the surface area. So when we apply dot product, y dot z becomes 0 and z dot z becomes 1. So we have 3 sin omega t, we integrate over the surface area. And we know that the surface area is for a circle is pi r squared. And if the radius is a, so we have pi a squared. So we have 3 b naught sin omega t multiply with the area of the circle and the area of the circle is 3 pi a squared so you have this equation here 3 pi a squared b naught sin omega t this is the equation for the flux now we need to differentiate the flux over time so the only thing we need to differentiate is the sin omega t because the other values are constant so we have 3 pi n a squared b naught. These are all constant. When we differentiate sine omega t, we will get omega cos omega t. So that's why we get the equation here or the value here, negative 3 pi n omega a squared b naught cos omega t. So now we just replace the value according to the... Uh, to the value given in the question. So we get this uh, value here uh, for the transformer EMF. So during initial condition, T equals to 0. So we have cos 0 equal to 1. So we'll get the transformer EMF as negative 188.5 volts. So since the flux is increasing, the current must be in the direction shown in figure 6. 6-3 to satisfy Lenz law. So we have transformer EMF is equal to V1 minus V2 negative 188.5. And for the current, we simply apply Ohm's law to get this value here. By subtracting V2 minus V1 to get this value here. Okay, example 2 is for Lenz law. So you have the figure here. You have two resistors, uh, V1, R1 and R2. And the magnetic flux is moving in the negative Z direction. So X is here, Y is here, positive Z is moving out of the page. So the magnetic flux is negative Z, so it's moving into the page. So you see the axis here. Right? So again, we apply this equation, flux equals to integral B dot dS, we replace as negative Z, 0.3T. So negative Z dot Z, Z dot Z becomes 1, so we have negative 0.3T and then we times with 4. Right? Because the area is 4 meters squared. So we don't need to integrate, we just multiply with the area, so we get negative 1.2T, where T is the time. So we, we differentiate over time, so T is disappears, we get a negative here cancel out, so we get 1.2 volts. So this is 1.2 volts, the transformer EMF uh, uh, along uh, or across the terminals. So since we have two resistors, we combine them to get the total current as 0 0.2 amps using Ohm's law. And then we have the voltage across each resistor as 0 0.4 volts and 0 0.8 volts respectively. Now, ideal transformer. So ideal transformer basically is the essence of this first method. Uh, 
where we have a changing magnetic field but a stationary loop. The loop doesn't move, only the magnetic field changes. So we have primary and secondary side. So we connect the primary to a source. So an AC source, it will generate current, current will flow in the coil and it will induce flux in the core of the transformer. Now, since the flux at the primary and the flux at the secondary for an ideal transformer is the same, so we are going to induce a voltage on the secondary side and we can find a very uh, convenient relationship between the primary and secondary voltage. So we know that from Faraday's law, V1 is equal to this equation and V2 is equal to this equation, but the flux is the same flux traveling through the core. So if we divide V1 over V2, the negative cancel out and the flux also cancel out. So we have a convenient relationship where the ratio of the voltage between primary and secondary is only dependent on the ratio of the number of turns between the primary and secondary. Right? Extending the, the principle, we know that the power at the primary and the power at the secondary is, must be the same to obey the principle of energy conservation. So P1 equals to P2. So I1 V1 equals to I2 V2. So we can get I1 over V I2 is the opposite. So we get V2 over V1. Okay. So we get another relationship where the ratio of the primary current and secondary current is inverse to the number of the turns between primary and secondary. So we have already find for voltage and we already find for current. Now let's find for resistance and impedance. So if we have input resistance at the primary and output or load resistance at the secondary, we can define using this equation here. Right? So from this equation, we know that the input resistance is equivalent to the ratio of the primary and secondary ratio number of turns squared multiplied by the load resistance. And by extension, if for the resistance we get this equation, for impedance we also get the same equation where the input impedance is equal to the load impedance multiplied with the ratio of a turn N1 over N2 squared. So these are the principles of method number one transformer EMF. In our next video lesson, we'll study about method two and method three.